tired of dealing with vein disease? Have your symptoms gotten worse? Oh, these spider veins are ugly. My legs and ankles are always swollen. My legs are tired of standing all day. While some symptoms can be managed by lifestyle changes, other factors are out of your control. Get help from the experts at Vein Clinics of Hawaii. To learn more about your treatment options, call 427-5565 or visit veinclinicsofhawaii.com. Aloha Hawaii! It's time for the Vein Clinics of Hawaii radio show. Their team's approach to diagnosing problems and developing solutions and treatment plans are beyond compare. So let's get started with your host of the show, Mike Buck, and medical director, Dr. Randall Julith of the Vein Clinics of Hawaii. Yeah, you know, welcome uh, welcome to our program. You know, this program uh, for the last year and a half or so have been covering all the different uh, situations that arise in venous uh, uh, disease. Dr. Julev is the medical director for Vein Clinics of Hawaii, located on four islands. Actually started on the big island uh, when he came to Hawaii, and then it, it moved over here to Oahu last, which is kind of the, the reverse of it. But, but I guess, Doc, the, the reason he started on the big island because you really liked it. It was a fascinating place to be, and you thought, if I'm going to come here, I might as well open an office here <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh, and also i'd like to do things backwards of course, well, yeah. you know. uh, but but in any case gang what we do e- each and every week we 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 look at different angles and different ways uh to learn about blood disease and one of the things that uh the today's program and i've been dying to have dr julev do one of these uh with where we can you know, d- devote a whole show to a condition and this is clotting and today inheriting inherited clotting disorders i think that there's a great amount of you know people that don't know what a blood clot is when you talk about venous disease most of us think a blood clot is that little thing that happens on your on your finger when you've cut it and then it stops bleeding and there's a little thing there uh and in some respects it is but when when we talk about clots and veins we're not talking about little things sometimes it can be pretty big things and i guess doc the the message of today is we're going to find out how these things get, you know, diagnosed and treated. But we're also going to try and figure out where they came from. You know, what mm-hmm. does it mean? What does it mean when you say inherited? Well, inherited just indica- uh, it would imply that uh, it's a genetically predisposed condition. So, uh, you know, it's something that we inherit from our parents or mm-hmm. grandparents, uh, and it's in our genetic makeup. Uh, and uh, just by virtue of that being there. Unfortunately, mm. it mandates that you may have uh, whatever whatever that you know gene that's yeah, being yeah. Uh, affected. The clotting gene, yeah, the well, dreaded clotting gene, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. And, and you know, you mentioned the uh, if you cut yourself or whatever. But um, where whenever there's an injury to tissue of, mm-hmm. any, of any kind, okay. and, and we're talking about uh, inside, out, it can, okay. it can, it can yeah. be outside. It could be yeah, yeah. Uh, but any time that there is an injury or uh, a disruption of normal, you know, ad- anatomic uh, tissue anatomy, uh, pr- very likely the clotting process mm-hmm. is going to start. And um, and like you said, yeah, yeah. I mean, normal clotting. It, you know, what is normal clotting? Well, uh, normal clotting is that if you cut yourself. I just cut myself shaving this morning, and it bleeds, and it bleeds. Yeah. You either put a little piece of toilet paper on it, right. or a septic pencil, or it stops. And that, when it stops, isn't that a clot? It is. Yeah. 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 I mean, if if you didn't, if that if that clotting mechanism that is you know inborn in, in mm. our built in our blood, mm. uh, if it's not there, or if it's altered. Mm. Uh, but you know, for instance, let's say it wasn't there. Yeah. Well, you would just continue to bleed. I was going to say, doesn't clotting mean that you're not going to bleed anymore? Exactly. Yeah. 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 If, or less. If we didn't yeah. have that clotting mechanism, mm-hmm. anytime we cut ourselves, you know, we would just profusely bleed, and essentially, you you know, lose all your blood. What about little kids that they get cut today? And uh, and then it clots, and then they mm-hmm. pick it off, and it starts bleeding again. <laughs> uh, in, in other words, yeah. you have to. Do, do you do you kind of want them to go away on their own? Uh, the blood the external clot? clot. Oh, oh, I see. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know. Otherwise, you might get a scar, es- right? Especially in the initial stages, mm-hmm. you know, where um, you know a blood clot forms, and that's what stops the bleeding. I mean, that's the purpose of a blood clot. Uh, you don't want to extract that blood clot because, yeah, whatever that injury was, whether it was a you know a, a mm-hmm. knife or whatever. 
um, yeah. chances are you'll start bleeding again. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, as that as that process goes on, then it gets hard, and you, you develop a scab mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes, yeah, you remove the scab. Well, you're taking essentially you're t- removing a, the blood clotted uh, tissue, and you know might that cause further bleeding from that specific site? It might often by the time that there's a scab there, it has started to heal and it's not going to bleed again. But, yeah, what I think is fascinating though is what we said at the very beginning. Uh, what what really is a clot? And, you know, we could talk about the inherited part of it, which we're going to do uh, in this program so we can figure out how to get it treated. But, I mean, when you talk about that, aren't there some things that prevent clotting? And sometimes it, we, if you have blood issues, don't you sometimes have to have medication so that you can clot? Uh, or in some cases, if you're taking medication, you better not because you're going to have some surgery and you don't want it to clot right away. Right. Um, yeah. There's both sides of the, yeah. there's both yeah. sides of the coin. Definitely. So, you know what what is normal clotting? You know what do we mean by normal? What, what do we mean by clotting? Well, you know, clotting obviously is going to result in a blood clot. But how does that happen? Uh, well, it happens because there are uh, a number of different proteins essentially. Uh, in our blood, they're circulating all the time, and if they are activated, um, and they're activated in a very you know a variety of different ways, but uh, you know when they're activated, they become active mm-hmm. in their function. Uh, you know if they're not activated, they're not functioning. So that you know that's why our blood doesn't clot mm-hmm. you know, just because those factors are there. Uh, but uh, you know the, those are proteins that when they're activated, then they lead to the clotting process. Most of these, uh, you know, proteins are made in the liver, uh, yeah. and then they get, uh, you know, sent off into the bloodstream, and they're just circulating all the time. We call those pro- we call those proteins clotting factors, and, and typically uh, the factors that we deal with the most are we we uh, assign a number to, so mm-hmm. it's factor five, or it's factor eight, or factor ten, and there's a number of them. Uh, but they're not only uh, those proteins, but there are other things like uh, calcium and other uh, little molecular entities that are going to assist in the whole process. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to lead to a clot formation. And, you know, we're going to be talking about mainly uh, proteins because uh, pro- the protein part of the clotting system is the part that is more genetically mm-hmm. determined, you know. So when we, when we talk about inherited clotting disorders, we're talking about, uh, at, you know, abnormalities in those specific proteins. Uh, but, you know, clotting also uh, requires platelets, yeah, and by the way, it was very interesting you're saying this again, because the other day on my regular program, I had an interview with the, with a lady from the blood bank talking about their need, particularly at certain times of the year, for blood, yeah. and that the blood is composed of three different things. So one donation of blood, you could you could help three people right. with conditions, and you mentioned platelets, mm-hmm. which is another one, and that is, aren't they needed in huge numbers uh, for those people that need them to uh, to help in, in, uh, in dialysis and some of the other things? Yeah, yeah, yeah platelets are... Uh, um, yeah, those three components are the red blood cells, yeah. the red part of our blood, uh, the plasma, which is the uh, tan, you know, the straw-colored part mm-hmm. of our blood, and then platelets. Yeah. And, and platelets, yeah, uh, invariably we don't, you know, we just don't have access to as, as great a number of platelets as a typical population might need. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm sure the lady from the blood bank was talking about the fact that, gee, we need, you know, blood for from people because uh, in one of the most important things things is so that we have a supply of platelets oh yeah can- absolutely big deal and by the way that's uh, if you're all negative go give some blood because they really yeah. need that all the time yeah. right right but it, it, it's interesting because almost everybody in 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 medicine has dealing with with blood or clotting issues in one one way or the other sure yeah, yeah. so it, when it comes down to uh when we talk about vein clinics of hawaii.com uh, let's talk about the clotting in veins, um, because I one thing I learned from I know we're going to get to this down the road, but one of the things that I learned from you, it's not the little clot that you've got from cutting your finger with a knife. No. Sometimes these blood clots in your veins can be two feet long. Right. I mean, scary stuff to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, there are things, you know, internally there are things that uh, kind of promote 
clotting and one of those things is what we call stasis mm-hmm. you know, where blood is not moving uh, as yeah. quickly as it as it should or and maybe there's a you know an injury to the uh, vessel wall the internal lining of the vessel wall that kind of thing and uh, and then a clot starts well as soon as a clot as soon as just a minuscule amount of clot starts to form then that the, and we call that the clotting cascade that cascade of reactions then builds up a long chain yeah yeah, yeah. and um and if that cascade of uh, you know blood in when i say cascade i'm referring to those clotting factors and whether they're inactive or or activated so the cascade go from goes from mm-hmm. one step to the next you know we, we one one factor is activated well then that cause the a- a- activation of another and another etc so cascade by the way I, I always call cascading the domino effect here it goes you know well yeah, it, yeah. It, it, over yeah, the falls it is sort of yeah, like that yeah, yeah. so um, and uh, so but yeah getting to your point if that clotting cascade continues <clears throat> then uh yeah a, a a fairly large clot will form and typically will will include will involve or grow to the entire size of the vein sure, it can yeah. do that yeah doesn't it virtually render the vein inefficient i mean you know, with with a lot of clots does it impede the flow of, oh definitely yeah, yeah yeah and sometimes it completely is completely impedes i was going to say it stops it right yeah, yeah. It, it can it can definitely do that so so we uh, so that's the clotting cascade and that's a, that's a good example of mm-hmm. what happens when the when that cascade is activated and then uh, just kind of happens uh, and there are there's different pathways. There's intrinsic pathways. There's entr- extrinsic, and that has to do with you know whether it's surface of our mm-hmm. skin or internally, like we talk about with DVT. Um, but uh, and again, platelets uh, play a huge role. Um, and what's happening there is that um, platelets <clears throat> platelets sort of aggregate. Uh, along with the um, you know the clotting factor products mm-hmm. um, and uh, eventually uh, you know fibrin and uh, platelets all kind of uh, uh, congl- conglomerate into a little aggregate and that's what then stops the bleeding or forms a bigger clot uh, whatever the uh, you know whatever the situation is promoting you know yeah and it's so interesting because like we said before most of us inherit our our varicose uh, problems, you know, genetically, yeah. you know, and, and does that mean that you absolutely, if your mom has them, you absolutely will? Probably. I mean, you know, I mean, in, in, you know, high likelihood, but by the same token, I think that this, this clotting thing is an equal opportunity problem. I mean, even if you are normal without varicose veins, um, I'm guessing that you can still be, you can still have clotting. People can. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I think the uh, the reason I wanted to talk about the inherited clotting disorders is because um, that that puts you at a much greater risk mm-hmm. of developing a DVT. You know, for instance, we talk about people who travel on planes for long distances. Yeah. Well, they're at a higher risk of developing a DVT. Anybody who does that. Well, you've is, told me before that you've actually had to uh, recommend to, uh, uh, you know, patients uh flying on this is not a good idea we need to handle this yeah before, you know, yeah, right yeah. right so if you if in addition to that you have an inherited clotting disorder then that's something that you should know about because that puts you puts you into a much greater uh risk uh, level for developing a dvt in those situations like travel or any any situation where you're going to be immobile you know that's that's kind of information that people need to know so, so there's we talked about the clotting system. Well, there's there's also something that works against the clotting. So it's, there, there's a there's normal anti clotting that's also uh, a part of our normal blood makeup, and uh, that has to do with the fact that we we need to keep our clotting system in check mm-hmm. because no. uh, for the same by the same token that if we didn't have clotting. You know, you would essentially bleed out from any. Uh, I was going to ask have. you that, and then there's another thing, and I know that you're probably going to cover this, but that means, um, can it also be a runaway problem where you have a lot of clotting? It's not just one clot or one DVT that your whole system can be farming clots. Yeah. You know? Well, that that would be an extreme case. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what you're alluding to is kind of what we're getting at here mm-hmm. is that you know, people, some people have a, a higher propensity to develop clot more so. 
than would be normal. And uh, and the uh, you know the, this anti clotting system that we have in our body controls that. So okay. you know if we uh, if we cut ourselves and uh, or we had an injury of of some type and that clotting mechanism was uh, was turned on. If there mm-hmm. wasn't a way to control it or turn it off, then our entire body would clot off. Sure, and I think yeah, that, that's yeah, what you're you know, getting, getting and, at before. And it doesn't pick good times to do that, does it? No, yeah. no. So, you know, so the anti clotting part of it is a, a very important part of controlling the whole thing. And uh, the uh, some of the, you know, molecule or some of the proteins that uh, go into that anti clotting mechanism are things like. Uh, protein S, protein C, mm-hmm. antithrombin three. We're going to talk about that a little later because uh, an abnormality of those molecules, even though they are in on the anti clotting side of it, if there's an abnormality in those, that that can mm-hmm. actually make give give you a higher propensity to develop clot also. So the, you know there's mm-hmm. abnormalities on both sides. Yeah, it, you know it, it. What's fascinating to me, and I've had this a little bit myself, gang. So kind of know about it a little bit. Um, I, I guess once again, uh, there. this is just one of the many different areas of concern that you have, but it seems to me that late night TV sort of, sort of worries a lot of people. Have you seen an increase in uh, patients that are concerned about DVTs because they see them on TV and they know that they've got, they've, they've either had one or could get one? Mm-hmm. Right, right. You know, so I mean, uh, in some respects, some of that stuff might be pretty good because doesn't it call attention to, hey, that's you, that might be you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I th- you know, much of that, much of the media and the advertising stuff is good because it's, mm, yeah. it's, it's at least bringing uh, attention to those kind of problems that people then can identify with and, and then hopefully go to their, uh, their private physician mm, and find yeah. out more about, which is very, very important. Uh, is it true that a lot of primary physicians will be quick to, to realize that this is an issue and refer it out right away? Uh, yeah, because of the, because of the types of treatments which I know you're going to cover. Right. I mean, you know, I know, I, I know. In your office, you're going to be treated a lot different than a clot than if you go to a dentist's office, you know, yeah. or, or or a a a massage therapist's office. You're going to get right. uh, so I, I'm I'm anxious to find out when we're going to talk about how you um, identify them and then how you treat them. Right. Right. So, um, you know, when we talk about inherited clotting disorders, it, it, they also run a spectrum. Um, some of them are, are more severe than others. Uh, some need uh, treatment, long-term, lifelong treatment, which would be, which typically would be mm-hmm. uh, anticoagulation. Uh, some are not so severe, and we just follow them. But um, so then the other question is, you know, we, so we're, we're going to talk about inherited clotting problems, meaning that they clot, people clot too much, but are there inherited problems? bleeding disorders. Yeah, I was going to well, say, you know, one is one is good because they, cl- I mean, one, if you have a bleeding disorder, clotting is good. But if you have a, a, a you know, what if, yeah. what if the shoe's on the other foot? <laughs> yeah. yeah, interesting. So, you know, everybody, I think most people have heard about hemophilia. Mm-hmm. And uh, hemophilia is a bleeding disorder. You know, people with hemophilia, they, they don't clot as well as yeah, they should. Yeah. And the reason for that is a, a decrease in one of the very important you know, clotting factors, and yeah. that's something called you know, factor eight. So uh, again, you, we have to we have to be we have to be concerned mm. with with both sides of this whole clotting issue. Um, so you know, what does it mean if it's uh, genetically uh, determined? And you know, our genetics have to do with our DNA. Mm-hmm. You know, the DNA uh, are those molecules within our cells that uh, have to do with. Uh, Forming the building blocks of proteins, basically, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of different proteins. Uh, well, there's probably millions of proteins that are are determined uh, by our DNA, and uh, they, you know, they either they're the building blocks, or they're the regulatory uh, mechanisms, or they're the messenger, you know, chemical messengers within our body. So. Um, it's a, uh, you know, it's a whole host of different things, but obviously the proteins that go into the clotting system are one of those things that our DNA, uh, uh, is responsible for and therefore the, you know, that gets back to our genetic makeup and, you know, every, every trait that we have, you know, f- uh, for instance, 
Uh, many people are familiar with the genetics of blue eyes mm-hmm. versus sure, brown sure. eyes, and you know if you have and hair color and stuff like that. Hair color, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know if you have uh, if you have brown brown eyes are more dominant than mm-hmm. blue, mm-hmm. and you know et cetera, et cetera. There are two genes. You know, yeah. we everybody's got two genes that uh, determine that kind of stuff. And well, there are two genes that determine um, the uh, the the genetic makeup or the uh, the way that proteins are going to be formed mm-hmm. as they pertain to the clotting system. So, and that's where the severity of some of these yeah. gets into. So, if you have one gene that is uh, creating an abnormal protein that, uh, that is a part of the clotting system, then typically it's not it's not severe i mean it's it's mild okay. and yeah. often those are people that we don't even treat long term however most of these uh, inherited clotting disorders if you have uh, both genes you know that are mm-hmm. abnormal if you've inherited one gene for yep. a, a disorder and you've inherited that same gene from your other parent uh, for that disorder, then that puts you in a whole different you know, uh, risk scale. And often those people are people that we end up having to uh, treat long term. So what you're going to do with that is mom and dad you, you yes, know, exactly. gang up on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. yeah, you can thank both of your parents, yeah. not just one. You know, but one of the things that I need to ask you about, and I, and I think that that's the reason why a lot of our listeners that see this late, these TV commercials about DVTs, which we seem to see a lot, is almost all of them are being suggested to be treated by uh, some sort of capsule. You know, I mean, there, there's medicines, uh, uh, and most of them aren't the blood thinners. And it w- would it be the idea that a blood thinner is going to go into that area and find that little clot and, and what, water it down, break it up? What, what's that all about? Yeah, blood thinners... Um you're right. Mm-hmm. A, lot, a lot of these things, or or even you know, a patient that's had a DVT. You know, mm-hmm. let's say there's a run of the mill DVT. We're going to put that patient on a blood thinner. Um, does that blood thinner dissolve the clot? No, it does. No, not. it does not. Right? Yeah, I've heard um, you say that. So uh, you know, we we give people, we put people on blood thinners immediately if we diagnose a significant blood clot because we don't want it to get. The main thing there is we don't want it to get worse. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't. What what does the blood thinning medicine do? Does it actually make the blood runnier or something i mean what does it do well it it makes it it makes the blood much less likely to clot okay so um you know does we, it still have the same consistency and the viscosity it, that typi- it used to typically yeah? it does okay. yeah uh, i mean i think uh, a lot of people will say gee my uh, my blood is more watery or yeah. thinner or uh do you ever i've heard that that's why I asked. Yeah, yeah ever yeah. since i yeah. uh, started this blood thinner i, I i'm cold all the time mm-hmm. you know, we hear that a lot yeah, yeah. and uh i think uh, most of the time probably those things aren't really happening it's just kind of in your in the patient's uh, perception yeah. of what's happening but um yeah it's not going to actually make the blood thinner um as uh, you know if, if you just look at it in its natural state so um so, what are some of these inherited blood cl- blood clotting problems? Uh, the most Im- the most common one, and as it turns out, it's fairly common actually in the general <laughs> population, is something called Factor V Leiden mutation. And uh, the, obviously, if, uh, the name implies that there is a problem with Factor V. Factor V is one of the very important uh, you know proteins that go mm-hmm. into. Uh, the uh, clotting um, system. And uh, so if you have a mutation of that factor, then it's going to alter its function. Um, the, uh, you know, the clotting mechanism is very dependent on factor V. Uh, factor V is made in the liver, as we uh, mentioned before, and it's, you know, it's produced in the liver, then it's kind of sent out uh, on its journey in the in the bloodstream, and it stays. It just circulates in the bloodstream until it's used up. Um, the defect that happens with this factor V mutation is that the uh, the protein itself is uh, then produced in a slightly different way 
from normal mm-hmm. such that it's not able to be it's not able to be controlled or buffered by those anti ah, mechanisms. okay okay now i'm getting it. Now so, I'm getting it. so uh, mm-hmm. you know and we mentioned something called protein s and protein c before well protein s and protein c are uh, natural anti we call those natural anticoagulants well the reason for that is because protein c actually interferes with factor 5 function and um, when it does that then it's controlling f- the factor 5 activity mm-hmm. so it's not overly active okay so if you, okay. if you take away that break you know if you take away that buffering that uh, you know that governor essentially mm-hmm. uh, on the function of factor 5 your blood is going to be more likely to clot. How do you coax that along? I mean, when we talk about different treatments and different things, once you've made that diagnosis of someone, how do you either medicate it or, or, or help get it dealt with? Uh, once you make the diagnosis of factor V Leiden mutation, right? Yeah. Um, oh, well, a, a little depends on um, whether there's one gene or two genes okay. involved. And if it's uh, if it's two gene, we call that, or, or if it's you know if it's just one gene, you know, with that defect, we call that heterozygous. Uh, if it's if both you know genes are positive mm-hmm. for that mutation, then we call that homozygous. So, so obviously, uh, when you're doing this diagnosis, you're not able to get the parents, uh, you know, blood work. No, but but won't the won't blood work of some kind give you an idea you, no. of what this blood is composed of? Yeah, yeah. It, not only an idea, it will tell you. Tell you right out. Yeah, yeah whether that's it's, what I mean. Whether it's yeah. homozygous yeah. or heterozygous. So, um, so the the likelihood of uh, or how severe that uh, factor five mm-hmm. line mutation is going to be is very dependent on whether there's one or two genes, and that is that often is prob- usually at the crux of whether mm-hmm. we're going to treat that or not. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, the, the risk of DVT goes up substantially. Uh, the risk of PE also goes up if they, if a and patient. PE is? Pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism. You know, blood, right. yeah. Uh, yeah. blood clot breaking loose right. and going in the lungs. So um, there's uh, even, uh, even above and beyond, you know, again, the general population, uh, people with this, uh, you know, abnormal factor five uh function there if they even if they develop a dbt they're even more likely to develop a pe yeah and that's why gang sometimes you hear about this when somebody's got this this deep vein thrombosis what the what we're worried about isn't the doc that uh, as it is where it is okay we can handle that but when a chunk all of a sudden goes off on its merry independent trip you don't know where that thing's going yeah 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 can they be big Oh yeah. And when they, when and is it at one extremity or the other of the of the? Uh, obviously, if you have a big long clot that's say six inches long or so or longer, yeah. uh, that it's going to come from the the top end. Yeah, the top yeah, the top yeah. of the leg, the yeah, thigh, yeah, yeah. or or even the large uh, veins within the pelvis. And and it goes then on its merry way, yeah. traveling up. Uphill with the blood. Upward, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the blood toward the heart. Mm -hmm. Now, typically, it doesn't do any damage to the heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, It goes through the heart and then out into the pulmon, into the lung circulation. Now, where it can cause some trouble. Yeah, and and depending on the size of that clot, will kind of depend, will determine. How uh, how much of an impact it's going to have on lung function? And yeah, if it's a very large clot, the way mm-hmm. we've talked about mm-hmm. before, you know, th- those types, those large clots can kill people yeah. instantly. You know, and uh, and, and and they do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they it's, do, it's sure. not an uncommon mm-hmm. uh, you know problem. But um, so uh, the the good part about it is that even if you have again, if you're heterozygous, you you only have one gene for factor five Leiden. The likelihood of you actually developing an abnormal clot is still fairly low. It's only about ten percent. Mm-hmm. So uh, even though it's a fairly frequent um, problem that we see in the general population in this country, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Luckily, it's the minority of people that actually develop a clot. Um, women with uh, factor V Leiden mutation have a little higher risk of miscarriage. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's one of those situations where... Oh, by uh, the way, I was going to ask that earlier. I'm sure there are people out there thinking this. Is that uh, is it an equal opportunity problem? 
I mean, you know, when you say pregnancy, that throws a whole new set of, you know, yeah. markers in there. But if you're talking with that, this Leiden mutation, is it 50-50 male-female, or is it more prevalent for females, or is there any it, good stats uh, on that? No, yeah, it's an equal opportunity yeah. okay. employer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so, yeah, so women... Um, women who are you know are getting pregnant they have a little higher risk of mm-hmm. miscarriage and, and that's one of those situations where um it's good that you might know you yeah, know yeah. so and that's why i encourage uh people to if if they to know their family history mm-hmm. you know part of the reason why we ask so many questions about history uh is that you know if you if one of your parents had uh, multiple blood clots, not just one. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. And especially if they, if you know sort of the scenario uh, around which they had the blood clot, um, it uh, kind of sheds a lot of light on it. There may be situations where you might want to be tested for this kind of stuff, just mm. so you know. You know, are you um, thinking or do, are you in agreement with some of the ads that claim uh, it lowers your likelihood of another DVT? In other words, you've got one, and that means if you got one, you can have more than one. You can have them more later. But if you're treating it, that it lowers the likelihood that oh. you can maybe drop the risk a, a lot. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, blood thinners. You know, the typical blood thinners that we use uh, are going to uh, decrease the risk, especially you know while they're on the blood thinner. Mm-hmm, sure. Uh, decrease the risk of recurrent DVT. Yeah, definitely. And that's one. Of, that's one of the goals, certainly. So, how, how frequent is what is the frequency of uh, you know factor five Leiden mutation in this country? Uh, and it's about three to eight percent of people in this country that have European roots. Um, and uh, the in, in Middle Eastern uh, genetics, they have a little higher. It's about 10%. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the Factor V Leiden, and as is the case for many of these inherited uh, you know, colliding problems, uh, it's fairly rare in African Americans mm-hmm. and Asians. Hmm. So, um, so, yeah, so that, that's kind of the uh, breakdown of how, free, how frequent it uh, happens. Uh, well, the good news is that it's a small percentage, yeah. unless you're one of the percentage. Right. Then that's not good news. It, yeah. It's not good yeah. news, but it, there's a little bit of good news because even, yeah. even if you are positive, it's uh, it's much more likely that you're not going to have a problem than you are because even if you have that trait, it's only about 10% of those people that have a major clotting event. What about somebody that's out there right now saying, I'm wondering if I'm, if I'm in that 3%. Mm-hmm. What tells that? How do I? In other words, every now and again, and, and I, it happens to me twice a year. As we age, it should probably happen at least that. But having blood tests and things like that doesn't that reveal a lot? Not just to to, to my vein doctor, but to any doctor. Sure. You see, see how somebody's doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the blood tests that we do for for clotting disorders um, it is a fairly extensive array of different blood tests. Mm-hmm. And it's not cheap. It, mm-hmm. It's it's pretty expensive, and so is it's it elective? Not, is it elective, or is it something driven by symptoms? Well, yeah, mm-hmm. right. We we don't. It's it shouldn't be used as just a screening tool. Yeah, gotcha. Um, that's what, you know, that's not, what I mean. Not, not everybody that walks into a doctor's office, you know, uh, you as you mentioned, you know, every year or so, you routinely get a CBC mm-hmm. or your mm-hmm. electrolytes and right. your lipid profile, all that sort of stuff. And you know, those those things are fine. I mean, you you people, we should be just kind of routinely screening for those types of labs, but. Do we routinely screen for uh, these uh, what's called thrombophilias, uh, the uh, genetic uh, you know problems with clotting? No, because it's expensive and typically it's not really needed unless there is a suspicion. So we selectively you know get these tests and. Um, uh, and typically, it's in a situation where we need to know whether the patient is going to need to be treated or not. Yeah, is that like some other thing that it is so critically needed to test or check because it fills in a big picture? You can't you can't really ignore this area. No, yeah. no, you can't. But uh, but again, you know, we do it. We do further. We do that kind of investigation mm-hmm. on a very selective basis. You know, if somebody's had. The uh, symptoms, you mean? Yeah. Well, oh. symptoms, or you know, uh, let's say the a patient has had a couple of clots, you mm-hmm. know, over a short period of time. Um, well, that's that's not uh, that's not common, and you know, so we may be thinking that there is some okay. problem. I get my fifty cent question to the program. Yes, and that is. 
Can you have one of these episodes and not know it? In other words, you talk about a DVT. Once you've been diagnosed, now you're on the lookout for a symptom. But are there some people that have them and have them and have them? And they're just not the big bombers that are really going to cause damage. But it, it, does, it, does it automatically just occur and reoccur? Not uncommonly, mm-hmm. we, we, we will find, or people will come in with venous symptoms, just chronic venous okay. symptoms, mm-hmm. and we do the ultrasound, and we find that they either have a, uh, a clot that's not all that old, mm-hmm. you know, um, or we find out that they have evidence of having had a clot, you know, in years gone by, and we can tell that from the ultrasound. And, and you know what, gang? I had one of these. That's why I'm glad I remembered to ask Doc this. And that was one time I had an ultrasound at your office, and we're, we're looking at some things. And I did have um, a little, um, uh, a little, you know, clot in my leg, but it wasn't. It was in my lower leg. It wasn't very big. It wasn't causing any symptoms or any trouble. It just got picked up when I was being examined. Mm-hmm. So isn't that sometimes if you're looking for one thing, and you, you talked about Mike, the ult- your ultrasound, one of your ultrasound people. He's so good mm-hmm. at saying, hey, wait a minute. Let me take a look at this too because it's not what I was looking for, but it's been pretty interesting. Right. You know, there was just a lot of stuff there. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And again, uh, that happens. Uh, I mean, it happens probably more than you would think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That people come in and they have a clot they, that looks relatively new, um, or they have a clot that is uh, long standing, yeah. and we can tell that it's old and fibrotic. And you know, that, that's what happened. So we took a look at it several months later, and yeah. it was the same, mm-hmm. which which indicated, all right, well, you know, yeah, it's it's good to keep an eye on this, but it, you don't need to have the uh, the whole the whole leg removed <laughs> at this moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Um, the uh, so then we always have to consider. Uh, I think getting back to the question of, of who do we treat, who do we mm-hmm. not treat. Well, uh, there are other things that can increase people's risk of having DVT. Just in general, you know, aside from clotting disorders, uh, and that is uh, you know the the usual things that we've talked about before: uh, increasing age, injury, obesity, surgery, smoking. Smoking. Oh, with this list keeps coming up. Then no matter what you do, yeah. And uh, you know, people who are pregnant, they mm-hmm. have a little higher risk in, mm-hmm. of of DVT. Uh, people who are on oral contraception, mm-hmm. you know, most okay. forms of oral contraception put you in a little higher risk of DVT. Um, so, for instance, a woman who is uh, pregnant and uh, you know she has maybe a I don't know, five, uh, four to six fold increase in DVT. If she has a factor five Leiden mutation in addition, uh, then the, uh, the increase in risk goes way up. So that's why, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it is important to know whether you have that factor or not because of the fact that it may affect your decision making. For instance, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, if if a uh, if a woman has a very strong family history of DVT, and there's uh, you know there's a high suspicion that maybe she also ha- might have mm-hmm. a, a genetic reason why she would uh, her blood cl- would clot uh, easier than normal, uh, and she's wondering whether she should get off of her blood uh, off of her birth control pills. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that might make that decision for her. You sure, know? Yeah. So, so sometimes it becomes important, even though uh, somebody has maybe not had a problem with DVT in the mm-hmm. past, you know, sometimes yeah. that information is important so that they can make uh, decisions, you know, informed decisions about their lifestyle. Yeah, and that, that's pretty fascinating because obviously, you know, um, there was a time back in the day when some of these medications you're talking about, particularly the birth control pills, uh, where they were just, you know, to control birth. And nobody really looked at what might happen to them later. Isn't it sort of interesting? Now, when you look at this vaping stuff, we didn't really have enough data on what vaping does or doesn't do. Right. Uh, was that also a cumulative effect of, you know, seeing that certain people taking certain medications over time could be affected negatively by that by that medication? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, what? Uh, so, how, how how commonly is DVT in people with the factor five Leiden uh, abnormality? Especially well, pregnant ladies, we're talking about here, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, the general population, or in the general population, the frequency of DVT is about one in a thousand adults per year. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's not an uncommon no, problem. No, it's a yeah. common problem. Now, if you have just one gene for that uh, factor five Leiden. 
it increases by a factor of 10. So actually, so the frequency is then 10 out of 1,000. So now, if you've got the two genes, one yeah, from dad and one from mom. Then it goes up to 100 out of 1,000. Wow, 10%. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So, um, you know, so uh, that's, uh, that's in general, that gives you an idea about, you know, uh, the likelihood of you having a problem if you have that gene. And that's, gang, why I, I so love what happens at Dr. Julep's offices. And you can do this by going to veinclinicsofhawaii.com. When we do the this thorough initial consultation and, and examination, this stuff goes in every folder. I mean, you know, it does, does, it's not just about a varicose vein. It's about all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. so the, the more often that you have, particularly once you have, you know, const- once you have uh, understood that you do have a, you know, a disease that needs to be treated, it needs to be, you got to, you got to do everything you can to do to stay in front of it. Sure. That's that's what I was getting at. Yeah, know? yeah. Especially uh, these, these ladies, particularly if you're going to get pregnant again. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, what do we do with respect to the diagnosis and treatment? Well, the diagnosis is relatively easy. I mean, it's a blood, it's a blood test, mm-hmm. as we mentioned before. You can either do a blood test or you can do, you know, actually genetic testing. Um, and, uh, but typically, uh, you know, we do an, an, an array of blood testing. And uh, you, typically, if we do, we're, it's not like we're, we're uh, looking at just one of these inherited mm-hmm. abnormalities. We're not just looking at factor V Leiden. Uh, typically, we're doing a whole, uh, you know, a, a whole you know, bunker worth of screens, mm-hmm. and uh, so it's re- but it's relatively simple to be tested, um, and then that goes to the question of who should be tested, and uh, you know, uh, going back to your question from earlier, you know, is is this something that you should just routinely get? Well, no, probably, probably not. not. Yeah, yeah, but we do it in a selective sort of way, mm-hmm. and who are some of the people that we would be suspicious of having? Having a clotting disorder, uh, one of those people might be a person who has had multiple DVTs. You know, okay. having having yeah. one, having a DVT one right after another, or even a superficial you know uh, clot. You know, something that we call phlebitis. Mm-hmm. That's all. That also can be kind of a uh, a red flag for the potential of uh, someone having uh, a clotting disorder. The other thing that we look for is something called an unprovoked DVT. So, you know, most people that we see, they come into the office if they're if we're treating them for a DVT. If we find out they have a DVT, most of the time there was a reason why they developed that DVT. Is there a wide range of, of factors that can be oh, that yeah. reason? Yeah. 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 And, and typically, usually, it uh, it has to do with immobility. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, where but where was that immobility? Were you on an eight hour uh, uh, you know, plane ride. Were you in the hospital? You know, for mm-hmm. a long, for several days and not really getting up and around. Were you sick at home in bed and you yeah. know, you know develop blood clots? So, um, you know, those are the reasons why typically people have a blood clot. And if it, if a blood clot is explained, then we're not as concerned about it. You know, we had one guy who's a friend of the family, and and he was hearing us do a show a while ago, and he said that you know what his problem was is that he was. He was bedridden with a bad back for a long time, and they were treating him. He actually developed some bed sores mm-hmm. because it was weeks, I think, you know, and I don't think he had enough care. You know, people weren't helping him with hygiene and some of the other stuff. Right. Anyway, he had he ended up getting a, a clot in his leg mm-hmm. just because he didn't use that leg for a month. Right. Yeah. Yeah, very, very yeah. common scenario, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's why, you know, over the course of the past, uh, you know, let's say 15, 20 years, uh, hospitals have gotten very uh, obsessed and, and, you know, rightly, rightly so, right? Rightfully so. Keep moving yeah, me around. To, yeah. uh, well, do, to yeah, do yeah, that, yeah, yeah. but also to identify people who are high risk for uh, potential DVT while they're in the hospital and, and give them blood thinners prophylactically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, there's pretty standard protocols for how we should protect people from DVT uh, because, uh, yeah, in the hospital, it's, uh, it's nearly an epidemic with respect yeah. to people developing not only DVT but PE and uh, and you know, pulmonary embolism, yeah, pulmonary embolism, <laughs> and, yeah. and and dying yeah. from that, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, and then the other situation is uh, if a person has a parent and they know that they have, uh, they know that the parent has a clotting disorder like factor mm-hmm. five Leiden. Um, then we we may very well test that patient for it 
if they, number one, have had a DVT, or number two, if there's, like I was mentioning before, if there's some lifestyle change that they uh, are thinking about making, or uh, you know, if there's some way that they would change, you know, mm-hmm. what they're doing, for instance, taking birth control pills, um, then we w- we might test that person mm-hmm. for it because they've got a little higher likelihood that they might have that clotting disorder since they have a parent that has it. So um, the treatment basically is, you know, uh, anticoagulation. and. Sure. Um, you know, we if somebody who p- comes in with DVT, we're always going to, going to anticoagulate them for some period of time, you know, usually three to six months, uh, depending on what exactly the clot's all about. But um, then the question thereafter is, would, the, would this patient benefit from being on long-term anticoagulation and basically life, lifelong? Life, life, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, if they are homozygous, if they have two genes that are determined that are determining the factor five Leiden trait, uh, then uh, the tip then typically, yeah, we are going to treat them because invariably they are probably going to have a second DVT. And, we and, and I'm, I'm also guessing through this that if you are a sibling or or if you if you have siblings and you're suffering this, it might be. And and maybe sometimes this information isn't shared within the family. Sure, maybe it should be. Right, because you know once you find out that you know if my brother has it, I'm likely to get it. Right, so right. I, I might have been lucky so far, but shouldn't I know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's it's all about yeah. education, yeah. so that. Uh, you know, people need to know the facts so that they can make uh, decisions appropriately uh, and, you know, have that information mm-hmm. so that their, you know, family doctor can help them make those decisions. Yeah, it's like that Ancestry.com. You never know what they're going to come up with. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, yeah. But that's pretty interesting, gang. If you've had, uh, you, you have a sister or a brother that have had constant vein issues and you can't see any in your legs, that doesn't mean that you don't have them. Yeah, yeah, right. And and also as it pertains to clot, if mm. you you know, if you have a, a sibling who mm. has had multiple blood clots, especially in the setting where maybe one of your parents also had multiple blood clots, then maybe you yeah, should be yeah, worried about yeah. that even though you have not had one yet. But um so what if you only have one gene? Well, if if you only have one gene, do we do we treat those people? You know, let's say for whatever reason we find out that somebody has the the factor 5 Leiden uh, mutation uh you know, gene uh, are we going to treat them just based on that information? No, we're not. Probably not. I was going to guess not. that. Yeah. Um, even if they have one DVT, you know, especially if it's a provoked, you know, if if they are in a hospital for a week and they develop a DVT or whatever, um, you know, are we going to treat that patient for the rest of their life? Well, uh, probably not. Mm-hmm. Although there mm-hmm. might be some situations where we would, um, if that patient is heterozygous, they, they only have one gene, and they have had multiple DV, DVT, then mm, yeah, probably yeah. we will, uh, unless the risk uh, of doing so is, is too high. Um, and uh, if you, you know, again, getting back to lifestyle management, you have to eliminate uh, the risks the other risks, because they're all sort of multiple, you know, if you if you have the factor yeah. five Leiden, uh, you definitely should not be smoking. Or, yeah. But you know, here's here's the thing that I, I I really get a kick out of. I'll talk to somebody that says, you know, um, I'm in pretty good health, and yeah, I still smoke, but you know, I don't have anything really wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, you say, you know, what you are is a time bomb, you know, and and I guess more and more people, and and a lot of people that are listeners of this program. Uh, first of all, we just I just learned earlier today, Doc has seen somebody today after we do the show that's relatively a young guy uh, to have the kind of troubles that he's having. Uh, and that's pretty interesting because he had varicose veins in his 20s. Yeah. And you say that that is certainly and, and now he's in his 40s. Of course, the, the problem keeps accumulating, but it wasn't really symptomatic. So he doesn't re- wasn't really doing anything about it for 20 years. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that and also just that. I mean, that shows you the the power of, ge- of yeah, genetics. Yeah, yeah, it does. Because I mean, he, you know, at the age of twenty nine, which is relatively young, not mm. the youngest patients we've ever treated, but uh, you know, yeah, twenty nine year old guy. Uh, that's uh, pretty young to, to yeah. be developing varicose veins, and uh, so yeah, he must have had a very strong genetic component to his uh, venous disease. Yeah, and you know, gang, before you um, think of, well, I'm going to close the book on this chapter, uh, there's there's so much more that we could be doing, but I, I want to tell you that if you already have other 
venous conditions, even if they've been so far untreated, wouldn't it be just a big relief to go through the diagnostic process? I mean, this is something you do all the time, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, sure. not everybody that walks into Vain Clinics of Hawaii, vainclinicsofhawaii.com, is going to go under the knife the, the, the minute they walk in. I mean, that, right. That's just not how it works. Right, you know? right. So, so in, in summation, let's, let's talk about this because I think that what we started out, when we started out to say that it's inherited, um, the risk factor is it must be extremely you know, magnified, like you say, when both parents are. And it, it would it even be almost non, you know, you, you have to be tested at some point in time. If you know that you have, well... Uh, yeah, if you know that you have a parent with a clotting disorder, mm-hmm. then I would I would probably take just about any reason. Yeah, if it were me, mm-hmm. I would probably take just about any reason to find that out. Because it, it, again, are you going to yeah. be treated? Probably yeah. not. But you know what? Let's but, look at something else. And I, and this I wanted to get in wedge this in earlier, and that was uh, many people travel. Yes. And if you're a young person traveling, your possibilities of getting uh, a concern are way less than if you're older. So it would mean that if mom and dad live back east and you live in Hawaii, it might be a good idea for you to visit them. Because isn't that a real game changer when you start getting up in years, having that possibility of those conditions or symptoms, and then going on a long eight-hour trip? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, age is a, a risk factor for mm-hmm. DVT just in general. Uh, now, if you put on top of that a clotting disorder, yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. it goes up tremendously. Um, so, and those are the types of lifestyle slash activity, uh, you know, decisions mm-hmm. that if you know that, you know, if you know you have those kind of uh, genetic uh, traits, then you need to then alter your lifestyle to uh, l- keep your risk as low as possible. Okay, what if we discover a clot on in, in my leg, halfway up my thigh? Um, what do we do once we say, okay, that's a clot, that's got to go? What, how, does it, how, how is it made to go away? Well, uh, we... Uh, most of the time, in some situations, we do uh, utilize a medication called a thrombolytic. Mm-hmm. And a thrombolytic is, uh, you know, a medication that's actually going to break down the clot. Okay. Standard blood thinners do not. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is there is a little co- bit of controversy uh, with respect to when thrombolytics uh, should be utilized, mm-hmm. you know, when we should be using a medication that actually dissolves the clot, because there's a, a fair bit more risk mm-hmm. involved. Yeah, because all mean, of those little pieces go somewhere. Uh, or y- could. Well, yeah, yeah that yeah. that, and also just the fact that you are altering the clotting system within mm-hmm. uh, the bloodstream so much that you may have a, you, it may go the other way, you mm-hmm. may have a spontaneous bleed. Mm-hmm. Um, so typically, and in in general, even people who are you know institutions that are treating uh, DVT uh, aggressively with thrombolytics, etc., those are only the yeah. very largest of DVTs. Okay. You know, in the yeah. upper leg and pelvis. Uh, uh, typically, the ones that are uh, any lower than that, you know, we wouldn't uh, recommend thrombolytics. But uh, so there are some situations mm-hmm. where we would do that. Now, that's not a pill. That's you go into the hospital, mm-hmm. oh, okay. and yeah. you know it's an invasive kind of procedure. Say, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know you put a you have a catheter put into the vein and mm-hmm. you know whatever yeah. vein we're working on where the clot is. Where right, the, yeah, yeah, where the clot is, and medication is actually infused into the mm-hmm. clot. Uh, and very controlled. You're being monitored. Very much. controlled. Yeah, yeah. Very controlled. Um, now, for for most people, uh, that's not going to be the route that you take uh, because it, uh, for most people, it's not going to mm. be applicable. But for for and for those, we put them on a blood thinner, um, and uh, you know, again, the blood thinner in and of itself is not going to degrade or break apart the clot or dissolve the yeah. clot. It's just going to promote stability of that clot. And it actually, with time, your body is going yeah. to break that clot down. Um, and, you know, sometimes, uh, well, not infrequently, somebody comes in and says, uh, yeah, I had a blood clot uh, 20 years ago in the, the upper part of my leg. I know exactly where it was, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, lo- we do look at it with an ultrasound. And there isn't any... Um, you know, any evidence of residual clot. 
Um, so you know your body mm. your body actually has a pretty good uh, mechanism to break it down. Now, does it always does it break down? Does uh, every time does the clot get broken down? No. Sometimes we do see some residual clot. But, okay, so uh, if we've piqued your interest a little bit, now it's the time to take uh, take some action. Go to veinclinicsofhawaii.com. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com, and and say that you know I, I was listening to that program about the in- inherited clotting disorders. Talk to my mom. Talk to my dad. They both had them. I want to see how I'm doing. Schedule a, a, a an appointment with Dr. Juliff and. Uh, and, and get that thing looked at as soon as possible. Thanks so much for being a part of our program. Have a good rest of your day. And remember, if you take care of your legs, your legs will take care of you. And that's uh, that's one. That's actually one thing that we can promise. If you take care of your legs, in all probability, your legs are going to take good care of you. Well, that's our program for today. And we certainly hope you enjoyed meeting us. Please come back next week for our next episode. And in the meanwhile, to learn more, please visit our interactive website, veinclinicsofhawaii.com. That's veinclinicsofhawaii.com.